So it's interesting when you bring that up as well about the different forms of imagination, because when people talk about imagination, it sometimes seems that the people will eventually get to just one form. But as you said, with some authors, they cannot believe that other writers start with uncertainty or that, you know, a crime author. There are some crime authors I know who halfway through the book go, I've just realised who's done the murder. Yeah, yeah. Um, another author, I remember talking to David Keenan, who wrote This Is Memorial Device. And he said, you know, there was a point where there was a character he hated so much. He was going, I can't believe this guy is so <laughs> horrible. And he was like, but, but I, I, it's me. I'm, I'm creating this person. And yet I'm also <laughs> fighting against creating. I'm so angry that this person exists. And yet that person exists only because of him. And I think, you know, those battles, so I know when you started writing the, the Vorbran, you started off, with, you only, you, you had like a, a short story read and you had, had three pages of an event, didn't you? And I the, have an opening scene. That was it, an, an opening scene. I didn't know where it went from there. And I tried to write it, I, and, and I tried to do it for many years. So I got to page three each time and threw it away. <laughs> then circumstances changed. Um, when people ask me about this, how, what, especially in America, what was the cathartic experience? I said, I think it's called a laptop. <laughs> Suddenly, this machine, you know, I'm dyslexic, and uh, well, it wasn't called that when I was a kid, it was just a, a cone with D on. But it was, um, it was, it, it suddenly allowed it to go and it just came out. And, and so there's, and there was no, there was no way of gauging it. People said to me, in, in, in such a complicated work, you must have had a structure, a plan, a map. No, 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 not at all. I just, I don't, as I go forwards, I forget what's behind. And that's a problem sometimes. We have to go back and kind of try to add it up. But I'm, it's always moving forward because they're, they're calling me. They're calling, the story's calling me. And I don't, sometimes I'm writing like, you know, like, you didn't. You didn't. It's a, kind of, it's a sort of ghost prophecy. Um, but I don't think that's... Um, I think if you give yourself up to imagination, and even more, if you dedicate yourself to imagination and say, you know what, I'm going there. That's what happens. That's the gift. Yeah. So, um, sorry, Alan. No, I was just going to say that I think that, yeah, that actually commitment to the imagination, that where i mean like in the vault where it's sort of or, or in hollow or in, in in those there's not thousands of books like that but where the author has thought how far can i take this because i think that society literature tends to impose boundaries um upon what can be imagined, uh, which I think people internalise and then sort of uh, become incapable of... So, I mean, this is particularly in fantasy. Um, this happens a lot that surely that's the one genre where every work should be a completely individual world created by one individual. But you get these tropes you get sort of dragons and dwarves and sort of orcs and sort of all of these things which yeah they are they are things that don't exist in the real world but i would prefer things like say in the vore or in hollow that don't even exist in the world of the imagination until the author has created them you know when you think what could be done with fantasy, that fantasy is a potentially a, a more infinite universe than the one that we're actually living in. And yet we explore so little of it. Absolutely. You know, it's sort of, I mean, like the, the, if you look at science fiction, I mean, the first science fiction stories could imagine as far as the moon. I mean, going back to Lucian and all the rest of them, people could sort of think, okay, we can get to the moon. But you can see that then there were some on the 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 near the planets in the solar system. Um, but you have to and then once we got warp drive, which was I think sometime in the 
fifties or something, and we could get to other solar systems in our imagination. But it's like it took us a while to think, well, you can't imagine beyond the moon. You can't imagine beyond Mars. And yeah, because people sort of build these perimeters. Yeah. Whereas the imagination is limitless. See, I wonder for, from both of you really about the, um, is some of this also about the Western imagination? Because I think sometimes when I travel around and I go and see art from, from, from what we consider non-European cultures, and sometimes when I look at films that come out, uh, you know, where, where suddenly you, you'll, you'll see that in some countries there's movies which are a musical one moment, then there's suddenly a melodrama, then they're a thriller, then they're a comedy. Whereas it seems that we, you know, when I think of all the kind of the superhero movies are basically the same story told over and over again and there is a comfort in the chaos of the world for people to say oh good so some some audiences they want to see an imagination that gives them structure yeah. in the chaotic world and others i know the older i've got the more i want every film to be like a david lynch film i want every movie to be uncertain i want people rowing about what it means i don't want to know if the goodies are definitely goodies and the baddies are definitely baddies so i wonder if that's also part of it that even the imagination we're talking about sometimes is is, is a, quite a parochial uh, imagination brian absolutely i have to say one extraordinary two words lucille hadji Ilyevich. And uh, uh, then I'll answer your question. Um, um, if you look at Japan and you look at ghosts in Japan and you look at spirits in Japan and you look at fantasy in Japan, there's something else there. It has a long tradition and it's variable. And they're not, they don't sit comfortably in one territory or the other. Uh, and for a long time, they were never really it illustrated. The sort of domestic ghost was only illustrated in the 19th century. Brilliant. And, and so in other cultures, it is there. In Islam, there are, there are genies and spirits which have a very different relationship to the way we think about those entities in, in the Western world. And that's not even touchy on Africa, which starts a whole other brilliant territory. So we should look there, really. Um, but so I'm not asking you, uh, yeah, the American trope is the most comforting one. That's why it's been made so much. It's the most comforting one. We know where we are. In the first three minutes of the film, we are told the beginning and the end. We're told who we believe in and what they are. And life is comfortable that way. It's not true. If those things were invented, you know, kind of around wars. And, um, um, but they now become something else. They become they're dangerous things. They're dangerous things because they always become the answer's always the same, and it's the wrong answer. It's the well, wrong question. It's it's also I think that they're genuinely dangerous because um, they create a certain mindset. These simplistic stories, where essentially, when you're talking about say the superhero narratives, what you've got is. Um, a unbelievable, fantastic threat to humanity that will be averted by an equally unbelievable and fantastic saviour, um, which, yeah, that's fine. That's all well and good as a children's story. But if that sort of settles into people's um, consciousness as yeah, this is the way that narratives work. Yeah. Then you're going to get um, the fantastic, unbelievable threat is going to be um, the underground Democrat pedophile demons <laughs> that were suggested by QAnon and the equally unbelievable superhero saviour that is working behind the scenes to rescue us all will be the Donald who's even got a superhero name and it's this is there's an infantilization of the narrative which i think has crept into the way that we conduct the world yeah to a certain extent and so yes this is very dangerous um like we were saying earlier that um yeah imagination is is the source of all magic all wonder uh, of everything but it is also really dangerous. It's a sort of, um, 
because if the imagination is not trained, uh, then uh, that's when it becomes potentially a quicksand that can just, people can spend their entire lives lost in a world of their own imagination and never actually accomplish anything in reality. The imagination has to be used um, actively. I mean, I think Peter Blakebad uh, on his wonderful album, King Strut, yeah, yeah. Uh, he, there was a line on that saying, um, imagination like a muscle will increase with exercise. Yes. King, Strut, King Strut developed his by having dreams and telling lies. Absolutely. Uh, it's a, uh, which is, you have to develop this stuff. You can't just have an imagination because you'll end up lost in the fun house. But, but, but the, the reality of that going wrong was Trump. Yes. Because that's all of those things, the superhero, all of those things in the most ridiculous possible territory in reality. Yes. Yeah. With a button on the table. And yeah. My God, it can't be true. It's all, this is like a uh, 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 watchman was a, a, a fairy tale compared to what's actually happened in reality because those beliefs are taken up as being real. Yeah, I, I think that sort of um, certainly uh, I have to take a certain amount of the blame for all of this. No, you <laughs> so, don't. <laughs> but, um, now, well, I think that fantasy is not just an inconsequential thing. It's what we build reality upon. Yeah, yeah, indeed. The things that, I mean, most of our, our actual personalities, um, I don't know about everybody else, and not, this might be a massive reveal that is not shared territory, but so when I was about 13, I suddenly realised that my actual natural personality if you can call such a thing um that had got me all the way through my childhood wasn't going to work when it came to puberty that um that wasn't going to work with um you know attracting sexual partners or anything like that that i had to i thought i'd better bolt together a personality out of things that I find attractive in other people, often in imaginary people. Yeah. And I think that a lot of us do that. And we, we fabricate our own personalities and then forget that we did that. Um, so we end up, oh. um, you know, just sort of, we are imaginary beings in yeah. a world that we have imagined. But yeah. I think you have a much greater responsibility than that. I think what you do is not that. I think what you do is to actually give the potential of imagination to other people. You don't just say, this is mine. You know, if you read Jerusalem, you have to be in it. You have to be in the family. You can't be outside. You have to be inside it and on the streets. And I think one of the things that's important is is that we're, we're actually still saying, you can do it. There's something in there, we're speaking the same language. Yeah. We are not separate from you. We are not some sort of strange being over here. We're speaking the same thing. And you can do it as well if you just believe that that part of your mind is probably greater than the bit that goes to the bank or the bit that is scared by those things and it's a result of another part of your mind which has never been spoken about or very rarely and and also that that has got i mean when there's lots of reasons why uh some people should really be writers um okay maybe there are some people who it wouldn't work for but the thing is about writing especially with writing fiction yeah. That whatever kind of horrible nightmare your life has collapsed into at any given point, if you've got another world 
that you are involved in creating and living in for a certain number of hours in the day and and of course even when you're not writing about it you're going to be thinking about it yeah then uh, it's not really escapism no no uh, it, it's not sort of oh i'm going to get away from all of my problems into this but it's it's, it's a necessary a respite you know sometimes and it's, it's great therapy it's a great meditation um i can't think of a better one um than the meditation that's involved in creating a world of fiction it's okay. sort of uh, it's very beneficial to the author and hopefully to the audience as well but i think yeah. it's also available to non-writers it's available to people who do lots of other things if they trust in their instinct in it if yes. you're a dancer or a painter or something else there's a way in which it's not about language. It's not only authors who invent no. a fantasy world. It's not only authors who invent an alternative reality. You can do it through live performance. You can do it through music. You can do it through so many things. But you've got to go there. You've got to say, I'm going to do it. And I'm going to put, I'm going to put my hand into this. And I'm going to grab it and do it. It's not some, you know, manby pamby kind of wishy-washy thing. You've got to work for it. You've got to really do it. I mean, it's like, um, say, and you've got to insist upon the reality of what you're doing. Yeah. You've got to commit yourself to it. It's like um, Rousseau, yeah. uh, Duanier Rousseau, who'd never yeah. been to Africa. So he just imagined Africa with such force yeah. that um, it's, it, it's, it's a dream Africa. It's a, it's a perfect Africa. It's sort of the fact that it doesn't look like Africa necessarily doesn't matter. But he did it so forcefully that he expresses some kind of immortal essence of the place, so never true. having been there. Yeah. I yeah. think true in so many things. It's, 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 you know, it's also true in in more lightweight versions. I mean, it's true sometimes in comedy, it's true sometimes in, 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 in television fiction, that sometimes there's a space where there's a little, bit, a little bit larger area where people can go and they invent another territory. They invent another, because they, I've not been there before, you know, a League of Gentlemen, those kind of things. I've not been there before, what's happening? And, yeah. and uh, but those are always seen those ignored, they're seen as just steps in um, uh, entertainment profiles. But I think that there are similar things. I mean, I, I think, I think uh, uh, the position we've been given is a little, little bit too close to profits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, so that can happen. It's sort of, and <clears throat> I mean, in my own case, uh, yeah, that has happened rather a lot till I, I mean, we did um, in 2016 with the Arts Lab. Yeah. Uh, we, we were going to have our first Arts Lab meeting, uh, our first Arts Lab performance. And it was, was it the 24th of June? Um, and it, was, it was a Friday. Um, so we came up with this great idea about how we were going to, the situation was going to be that um, all of culture had suddenly died overnight. There'd been some apocalypse, Armageddon, as we <laughs> call it. And that sort of in the cultural vacuum that sort of is left behind, this um, fascist baboon um, rises to prominence. Uh, now, we arrived to perform this on the day after the Brexit vote. <laughs> um, so, so uh, <laughs> yeah, you can see, you start to wonder whether sometimes, um, yeah, is it me causing this? Or am I just sort of um, predicting it or whatever? It's, uh, I, I've, I've thought about why don't I just write nicer stories? <laughs> and then perhaps we'd live in a much nicer world, you know. <laughs>